When disaster strikes, you can count on the emergency damage experts at Paul Davis. Fire, flood, mold, or a storm, it doesn't matter. You can contact Paul Davis. Always devoted, always polite, always respectful of your needs. Learn more at acetj.com slash Paul Davis. Pat Monahan from Train. Let's recap a couple of things. You've got millions of songs and albums sold around the world. You've got a brand new album coming out called AM Gold, and you are the first guest on the And the Rest is History podcast. Which one of those things is most important to you? I think the third one for sure. Thank you. I, 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 hadn't even, <laughs> I hadn't, don't even need time to think about it. Good. We're going to get along just fine then. Yep. So let's start with the name of the podcast, because this is what I want to know. If you had to pick a moment right now, which is essentially the moment you could look back in your life and say, and the rest is history, what would that moment be? Wow. Um, you know, I, I say that only when I talk about meeting my wife. Really? Uh, I, the only time I ever say and the rest is history is when I'm talking to my kids about meeting my wife. And what was that moment like? It was uh, like nothing else I've ever witnessed or been around in my life. I, uh, I had just been out of a marriage for several months. And, uh, you know, I was never a guy on the road that uh, didn't play by the rules. And so uh, I hadn't been in love or been loved in so long. And I, uh, never, ever asked to meet anyone from stage or after a show or anything, except this one time. Uh, and there was this, this beautiful girl who her mom made her go to the show cause her mom is a big train fan. And, uh, and then I just asked one of the crew guys, if he would just go, please ask if I could just say hi to them afterwards. And, she was engaged to be married at the time. And uh, I just was like, I just got out of a marriage. You know, is there any chance you would have coffee with me? And so we had coffee and uh, she broke up with her boyfriend about two days later. And we just never left each other's side. I have an amazingly similarly story, similar story, not to get off into a, on a, on a tangent here. So we just get started with this, but I just out of a divorce a couple of months and your wife's younger, much younger than you. Is that right? Well, yeah, you said younger and then you went to much younger. Is that like <laughs> a thing you're trying to get me with? No, no, no. Because my, my wife is considerably younger than me. Yeah. yeah. Because she's 24 uh, she's, year age gap. She's 13 years younger than me. Okay. And so, uh, so, and I, I, my wife had listened to the show for a long time and we met, she introduced herself, um, sitting in a, uh, like a sports bar when I, she was having dinner with a friend and saw me and she said, I look like yeah. the saddest thing sitting at the end of the bar, eating fish tacos, drinking beer by myself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and immediately it was like, Oh my God, this, this spark. So I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's a, it's a weird thing because none of those things I would have ever uh, imagined doing, you know, even a year prior to that or whatever, but it was, it was the, the only right. time you ever saw somebody from the stage that you only had. time in my whole life that I would ever have considered like wanting to meet somebody. That's awesome. Not so, that there's not beautiful people in my audience, but yeah. for me, it was like, that was not a thing. I was not yeah. allowed to do that. I mean, I remember when I was uh, in my first marriage and we had just gone out on tour. This is not a joke. This is like, now I look back and it's heartbreaking because this young girl in, uh, Athens, Georgia, she came up to me after we played and she said, Hey, how are you? My name's uh, whatever. And uh, I, you know, I, this, this girl's gorgeous, by the way. And she said, I was just in the, the new university uh, playboy magazine. So of college students or whatever. And she said, I was just, my friends and I were wondering if you want to hang out. And I said, I absolutely do. Let me go. Uh, let me just go take the gear out to the car. And then I got the hell out of there because I knew where that was going. And that was not where I wanted to be. The safest place you could be at that moment was not there. She's getting not the car there. and drive yeah. away. 
but that was how I ran my life. Like I was, you know, my goal was to try to get music out there to people. My goal yeah. wasn't to, uh, you know, find a new lover. And where did the music start for you? What was the first thing that really piqued your interest or your curiosity in music? When I was a young kid, I think I was about eight years old. I said to my mom, Hey, I think I know what I want to be now. I want to be a musician. And all she said was, okay, but you're not going to get any sleep. And I was like, what the hell? I really <laughs> wonder. But she was right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to play drums. So my, my dad figured out how to buy me a drum kit and I annoyed the hell out of them for years in the basement. And uh, as I drummed in bands, realized that not a lot of boys were confident enough to sing because they didn't want to embarrass themselves and so i i said i'll do it temporarily till we can find a singer and then realized that girls actually liked the singer and i was like cool why don't you guys play the drums i'll get out front and uh, that was kind of how the whole thing started but i mean inspired by music i was the last of seven kids so listening to all those records that my siblings were playing from you know uh uh, the Ohio players and Zeppelin to the Beatles and everything else. That's one of the great things that I think most people enjoy about your music is that it, it doesn't, it, you always know it's you, but it doesn't sound the same. I mean, even within each album, you'll get different styles, different types of music, different feels. And then you pop up and do something like you did with the Zeppelin album, your Zeppelin covers record, which was fantastic. Um, what's the writing process like for you in that? Is it a, I'm going to write, can you try to write something with, can you write with something in mind or is it just what comes along? It changes uh, and it has to, because, you know, as I think we mentioned last time we talked how different music is not just for you in, in your role, but me and my role. Like when I started, there were CDs and there was only a limited amount of shelf space. And so there weren't, wasn't a lot of camaraderie am, among artists because we were fighting against each other in a lot of ways. And some people would become friends, but it was all kind of like not real friendships. And um, then as time moved on and, and it became iTunes, it was still charts and now it's streaming. And um, I never want to make music that sounds like what you're hearing right now because that's two years too late you know so if i try to if i try to sound like sam smith or or khalid or or anything who i love i love their music or or even justin bieber like i love justin bieber's music who's ever writing those songs is very gifted but if i try to do that it's two years too late like I can't be inspired by that, but this new process for me writing on the, you know, the internet with my band through zoom was very frustrating at first, but instead of me listening to new music, I wanted to listen to older music and be like, what is it that I could be inspired from the past? And, uh, and that was the first time I did that. And that's why this record sounds like it's a little bit more from the past. So for you, when did you know, when did you know you had it, like whatever it is, when did you realize, oh, I can write songs. I'm good at this. I'm good enough to just, you know, dump everything and head off to San Francisco. Well, the real it moment wasn't for writing. It was, uh, so I, I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I was in a cover band. That's why I love Led Zeppelin so much. We would do three sets. We would do like the Who Cares set because they were just songs we loved because nobody was in the bar. Then the second set, a lot of people would be in the bar. It'd be dance songs. And then the third set, people would be hammered. So they'd want to listen to an hour's worth of Led Zeppelin. So we would do that. So while I was in that, Cher came to town. And we were playing a place called Sher Sherlock's, which was like a 500-seat bar. And Cher was playing in the 5,000 seat arena that night. And her guitar player came to have a beer after his show. And he came up to me and gave me his phone number and said, Hey man, you, you have what it takes. If you ever get to the LA, call me. So I went home and packed up my stuff and basically went to LA and I called him and we never connected. 
Uh, but his name is David Shelley. He just passed away a couple of years ago. And I always thank him because he didn't, he didn't like do anything for me in LA, but he gave me the moment that I needed to leave to really try to pursue it seriously. And then I moved from LA to San Francisco. Why the move? I've always wondered that. Why, why did you move from LA to San Francisco? Well, you the, there's a, coffee houses and everything, right? There's a real story to it, which I don't think I could get in trouble for, but at the time, the guys that I started train with, uh, there was a bad reputation. For, you know, one of the guys had said a few things and made a few deals or, 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 didn't do the deals that he said he was going to do that being in LA would have been a dead end road for us. So we had to go somewhere and San Francisco was the, the most meaningful place because it was the beginning of like coffee house era where people were really playing coffee houses a lot, not making any money, but definitely becoming uh, popular. You could get a name for yourself if you, you know, sang good enough songs. You know, you had your three, you had your 10 minutes at the coffee house that could turn into a lifetime, like what, what happened to train. So, did you ever in those moments doubt yourself? Were there ever moments you were like, okay, this is probably not going to happen? Were there ever those moments you thought, maybe I should pack it up and go back to Pennsylvania? This isn't working. Yeah. I, I am not a religious guy. I, I grew up in a Catholic environment. Uh, and I remember driving, I was a house painter in San Francisco, so I would paint houses all day and then I would drive all the way home because I couldn't afford to live in San Francisco. I'd drive 45 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes home, depending on traffic, and then go right back to San Francisco after I showered and sang songs and then do the whole thing over and over and over again. I just remember being on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge once on our way to go play some girl's living room. And the guy, <laughs> that's not even it, a joke, really. Some no, living room. Yeah. And this and the guy that I started the band with, he got out of the car and I just looked up and I was like, something's got to happen soon because I don't know if I can take much more of this. And it was uh, very soon after that, that something happened. And it long, was uh, how long had you been doing that stuff? How long had that been going on? It, it felt like forever, but it was probably 18 months. Uh, I mean, writing songs and playing for free, just and I mean, I remember going outside of clubs and not being able to get in. I remember like we're out with, uh, w- with John Popper this year. I remember seeing him at a club that was packed and we had just been getting started and like looking in and, and seeing fog glass. Cause we couldn't even see anything. It was so many people in there just thinking maybe one day. Uh, but we just needed always to be reminded that there was a chance. So when you're in that situation, people hear those things. They think, well, your first album came out. You had meet Virginia. It was a hit. And the next thing you know, you had drops of Jupiter came out and it blew up and exploded. It's like, oh, it's overnight success. But there's really no such thing as overnight success. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I've talked to the Hootie and the Blowfish guys about that. You know, it's like, yeah, it only took 10 years to get overnight success is their, their kind of story. Yeah. Did you have any big disappointments along the way? Moments where you thought like, this is it, this is our chance. And then it, it didn't it evaporate it or fell apart or whatever. Yeah. I mean, most of the disappointment that I have is like in my own performances, uh, I had to make some life changes to get better at what I did. But, um, but the big moment was that we were managed. Finally, a manager took us on. Nobody wanted to manage us. And finally somebody did. And they, uh, we, we had an opportunity to sign a record deal with Columbia records but they didn't want to come to San Francisco. They wanted us to fly to New York and perform. And then we were supposed to meet the next day and sign a record contract. That was going to be the deal. So we went and played. And the next day they never invited us in. They just sent us back to San Francisco without a record deal. So that became the real tell moment where I remember we were using the counting crows record or uh, practice space to to practice because they were actually it was their storage spot we used as our rehearsal spot because they were on the road all the time and i remember there was a chalkboard and, and i said hey guys you know this was a major blow so we've got to figure out what our common goal is like we we aren't best friends we didn't go to high school together this is a band if we're going to stay a band, we got to figure out why we're going to stay a band because up until this point, it's only been to get a record deal. 
because there's not a lot of love there. You know what I mean? It's just a bunch yeah. of dudes. It's a business. Yeah. And um, we all had one goal and it was the only one goal that we had. Cause you know, like there was an honesty. It was like, I want to get rich and I want to do this and I want to And but the one that we all had was we want to make a record. So we borrowed money from friends and family. Uh, we borrowed $25,000 and had some friends help us record it. And we made that first album with Meet Virginia on it and Columbia Records uh, signed us. The, the, same, the same group that didn't want us said, okay, we get it now. Very cool. So was there a moment when you realized like, okay, I'm, I am a songwriter. Was it once you got signed or was it before that, that you were like, oh, I write good songs. I know I'm a good songwriter because it takes a lot of confidence to keep putting that stuff out there and waiting for, you know, hoping somebody picks up on it. Yeah. It, I, I don't know if, if there was a, uh, that moment where I was like, Oh, I, I know how to do this. I think, you know, my mother passed away and I think she had to have sent me drops of Jupiter because I wrote it in 15 yeah. minutes. It was so fast. And uh, I woke up from a dream and I wrote the song and played, you know, the demo for my band. And uh, I, I think maybe at that moment I was like, maybe I'm just a vessel for other people. So I started going to Sedona before I do every record. And I ask all the past musicians to send me what they never got to do. And uh, whether it's working or not, uh, that's what I continue to do. Yeah. And do those things come to you quickly then? Does everything come to you relatively? Are you a, a no, like when you get it, do you get it all at once or is it, is it sometimes together? like yeah. the song AM gold happened very quickly, uh, but I knew what I wanted to do and it was uh, you know, it's a self love song and I wanted it to sound like a little disco y cause I needed some tempo on the record. And, but a lot of these songs take forever. Like there's a song on the album called betting on me. And, uh, and it was inspired by a guy that I was playing golf with. His name is Sidney Rice. He's a good friend of mine who used to play for the Seahawks. So we we're playing this little game called Wolf, which means, you know, we, there's like four or five guys and uh, Wolf can pick a partner and he didn't pick anybody. And I was like, Sid, you didn't pick anybody. And he said, I'm betting on me. And so I took that and made it about me like it's basically my story of how i've always been the underdog and no one is expecting for train to make a record right now that anyone cares about except me i'm the only one banking on it and uh and so that song came pretty quickly too so when you write things like that are you writing am gold during the pandemic Yes, the whole thing, because I started writing before the pandemic, but that album was really turning into like chasing radio. And and my manager recognized it pretty quickly. And, you know, I'd send him songs and he wouldn't send me, you know, these amazing responses afterwards. He'd just be like, <laughs> oh, that's a, you know, he'd be like, that's a good one or whatever. But <laughs> when I started sending him these songs from, you know, these Zoom calls with my band, he was like, see, this is what you need right now. And uh, this is a much, much, much better album than the other one would have been. Okay, it's interesting. He said, this is what you need right now. Because yeah. one of the things that I wrote down was, did you give any thought to what the world needed right now? Because AM Gold comes out and it's a real, man, it just feels good. It just sounds like a good summer song. Like it was going to sound great coming through speakers somewhere. Was yeah. there any thought given to it? This is what the world needs right now. Something to kind of pick them up. Well, you know, I don't know that I'm uh, uh, I don't know that I'm the kind of leader that you should be uh, listening to what I think the world needs. So I've never been mo much of that kind of guy, but I know what I need. And it's certainly not um, uh, it's certainly not the pop songs that I was writing. Uh, what I need is real songs about real things in my real stuff. And I think that that will transcend into what other people need, which is w w whether that's the world or just the small circle of train fans. I think we all need these songs uh, to feel these feelings because they're pretty big. I, I cry at least once while I listen to this record. Every time I listen to it. 
is it, do you cry over the same things every time or is it something different every time? No, there'll just be different moments where I'll be like, man, that was real. That I, I lived through that and that hurt. And it still reminds me of those moments, you know, like, uh, and it's a beautiful album. Like uh, sometimes it'll just be a string part that I'll just be like, wow, I missed it the first time. And it yeah. just brings tears to my eyes because of how powerful the moment is. So the new album AM gold comes out May 20th. What's on it that you are just sitting there thinking like right now, Oh my God, I cannot wait for the world to hear this song. There is a song on it. It's a second song on it. It's called running back. And uh, it's funny because I, I wrote this song long. Like you, you, This is before the pandemic that I wrote this. And uh, I sent it to my friend, Marshawn Lynch, uh, who also was on the Seahawks. And he, uh, I said, hey, I just want to let you know you inspired me to write this song because it's about being in a relationship. I want to be your running back. Like he was such a powerful part of that team that, you know, on and off the field that I've felt he's the most authentic guy I've ever met. Like there's no part of him that's pretentious. And I wanted to, I wanted to write that in a song and it's probably the best vocal that I've ever sung. And so what's the, do you know, like when you're in the booth and you're recording and that, and this that is moment, my booth. I sang yeah. the whole record right here. So do you know, like when it's all happening, you're just like, oh my God, I'm, I'm killing this. I'm feeling this. It's, it's all just, you're so locked in. Are you aware that you're locked in or is it not until after when you hear it, you're like, man, that was intense. You know, it's a, it, it comes both ways. Sometimes I'll be like, that was special. And then there'll be other times I'll be like, I need to sing that 110 more times because that was garbage. <laughs> uh, but other people might be like, dude, we use the first take. It yeah. was done. Uh, so, you know, I know people, Martina McBride used to be a good friend of mine. I think she comps her own vocals. And I know that Michael Bolton does. I know that there's a bunch of artists out there that comp their own vocals. And that sounds like the most horrifying time to be alive, like to listen to your own stuff and pick out the parts that you like. And, and I, I, I don't want any part of that. It has to be somebody else's perspective. So do you ever walk around the house and think, you know what I should do today? I should throw on Save Me San Francisco. And listen to that album a little bit. Do you listen to your own stuff at all? Or is it always somebody else? I listen to, to, I listen to my own stuff when it's done. So I know, and then I'll listen to it a hundred times just so I know it and feel like it's the right thing. But I will turn on train radio sometimes uh, when, you know, if there's like a playlist thing that I, because then I can hear, I get a chance to see how people are connecting train to what they listen to. Like, is it, is it John Mayer? Is it Maroon five? Is it new artists? You know, sometimes they'll, you know, there'll be a Beatles song and I'll be like, wow, that's a pretty cool connection. Like whatever yeah. the algorithm is that they're using. Sometimes I'm like, ew, I got to get rid of that. And sometimes yeah. I'll be like, that's awesome. So what does that mean to you to be some that important in people's lives? I mean, you've been around a long time now, you've been, you're just over two decades and you've had tremendous success. And obviously you've done something, whether it's the hits or not, that means a lot to people. Do you ever kind of take that in or you try not to think about because it's kind of overwhelming or what? Well, you know, there's such a, uh, there's such a level of success in all of this, you know, that I feel like I, I have succeeded at, a lot of things, uh, mostly being, uh, you know, a different human than I started as, um, I think, I think that I didn't have a lot of tools as a kid and now I, I have many and I can teach my children how to be, uh, a different level of human than, uh, than I started as, and that's important to me. And I think that I evolve as a songwriter and, and as a, an artist. Uh, I've always considered myself more of an entertainer than an artist because artists can be difficult and entertainers can be nothing but fun. And uh, I don't know. I, I think that I've evolved in a way that success for me isn't, uh, it's not what it used to be. It used to be like, Hey, I, am I the most popular band? Am I, you know, the whatever. And, and now it's like, you know, I get to play golf with some of the greatest 
people I've ever met in my life. And I never would have been able to do that had I not written drops of Jupiter or whatever. Yeah. So what is it like? How different are you as a person now from the guy that put out meet Virginia? or drops of Jupiter in the, in the, in the 20 years, how are you different? Cause you talked about it. It seems like you've worked on yourself a lot and you've now become pretty proud of yourself as a, as a person, which is a really good thing. Yeah. I think, you know, there was a time. So when I, when, when we were in the beginning of that, uh, our career, I got sober because, uh, coming from Pennsylvania, you know, you, you do two things. You, uh, a, you drink booze and you uh, do stupid whatever. And uh, I was I was extraordinarily unsuccessful. And so I got sober and I got a great therapist and I started to do a lot of self work and build this tool shed. And now I drink wine, and I drink too much wine. But I drink wine, and mostly it's because when I was sober for all those years making songs and seeing, you know, people around me partying and, you know, doing, I was just filled with rage. Like I had so much anger because I was like, why can't everybody just focus and do the work that I'm doing? And like, I just had all this, these feelings of righteousness and that was not who I wanted to be. And so I, uh, I'm not saying that wine fixed it. I'm saying like, I finally got to the place where I could like not think about other people as much and think about me. And now I can like enjoy wine and sit and understand things better instead of being like, why aren't you like me? I'm like, you are beautiful and special. And I, I love that. So did the rage or the frustration affect your music affect your writing at all? I think so. I I think that for a couple of records, there weren't a lot of great songs on it because my focus was success. It was get a hit song. This is what the goal is. Instead of, instead of tap in, man, you, you know, you had a well of emotions that you're, you know, you're, you express them through music. And I, I lost touch with that. So I want to, a couple of notes about songwriting, because I, um, as a longtime fan, I kind of have you and as odd as this might sound, you and Steven Tyler, I kind of put in a very similar um, box, so to speak, as songwriters, because you can both write very fun, witty, smart lyrics, and you can also write very deep, heartfelt, emotional lyrics. Although your songs may be may be totally different, but here's one of my favorite, probably my favorite lyric you've ever written, and I've always wanted to know this story. There's a song called Landmine that you've done, hmm. and the line is. It's 5 a.m. And if I run, I'm sure to pay for what I've done. But if I'm st- if I stay, I'm sure I'll wish I ran. Yep. That is such a line that encapsulates this god awful, hopeless feeling that this guy is feeling. What's the story behind that song? That was me revisiting getting married the first time that it was it was a feeling I remember. Uh this there's no i can't win there's no win here i can't win so did you have that moment you had that that very moment yeah of course wow it's a you know when you're a young person and you're influenced by the people around you and you don't want to disappoint people uh it can be very difficult like i'm watching with my wife i'm watching uh uh a, a show called vikings because she's, you know, she's Norwegian and, you know, the whole thing is so fun for us to see how these Vikings really, and it's a history channel. So it's, I'm hoping that there's some truth to it, but there is, you know, there's a real connection between people that they don't want to disappoint the people around them, but then there's a willingness to disappoint them when they finally reach a point of knowing themselves. And so I had to reach a point in, in like, there's a book that my friend Matt Nathanson turned me on to called the courage to be disliked. And that helped me a lot, like help me understand, like, you're going to disappoint people like you and I could, could get off this zoom. And I could have spent the entire time complimenting you and hoping that you like me and you like me and you like me. And then you get off the zoom and you're like, that guy's kind of a knucklehead. So 
all my trying and wanting you to like me was about me, not you. And so I had to try to figure out how to stop worrying about that. So the flip side of that, is there what's something you've written that is there anything that, that stands out to you that the moment you wrote it, you thought, look at that. I just wrote that. That's that is a great line that I just wrote. Yeah. Every time I do that, it's garbage. Like every <laughs> that time gonna be, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. You come back to you like, this is not as good as I thought it was. Yep. Yeah. 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 There's uh, I have a lot of moments where I'm like, this is a hit. And then it doesn't even make the record. You know, right. it's this, uh, I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm better at just writing and then passing it along to the people that have a better sense of things. So you're getting ready to go out on the road. You've got a big summer tour with old friends. You got jewel and blues traveler, which anytime um i go to a train show you're one of the first dates that my wife and i ever had was going to see you outdoors one summer it was a just a magical night saw you with hall and oats which was a great tour by the way but mm. now you're going out with jewel and blues traveler first off is there a comfort level knowing that you've reached you've attained a level of success that you just know hey we're going out on the road and that means we're going to go out and play some big places and a lot of people are going to come and it's going to be a great time Sometimes right now is a different time because of uh, the pandemic, you know, so so doing a tour, planning a tour like we'll we have a cruise that will be announced in a week. <clears throat> like these are a little bit more uh, unsure times like will people. Is this as easy as uh, it once was, you know, will people come in and see the show? Will people be interested in this record? Uh, m my goal has never been to become. Uh, a heritage band, I, I think in a lot of, a lot of ways, I've thought of that as a bad word. Eventually it will happen, but I want some type of relevance. You know, I want to, I want to try to have a song on the radio. I want to try to keep making music that is good and competitive with what else uh, is out there. And so um, it's never easy. It's never going to be easy. I remember one time I was on uh, good morning America and Jane, uh Goodall was there and Jane came up to me and she said hi Pat how are you and I said you know today wasn't a great day and she said even when it's easy it ain't easy is it and that meant a lot to me and and I uh, I wrote that in some songs too so are you looking forward to going out obviously you are looking forward to get the stupid question on my part you're looking forward to going out but is it different when you know you have somebody that you've known for a while like you mentioned the guys in Blues Travel are going to be out with you and Jewel. These are people that have been contemporary. So it's almost yep. like like a fun summer get together and just happen to go out on the road and play. Some I sure places hope so. Yeah. I mean, I've been wanting to do this tour for a really long time. I'm hoping there's a lot of barbecues and, you know, glasses of wine and Frisbee throwing after the, the tour. We've we've toured with bands like we will go out and throw the Frisbee for two and a half hours after we have these light up Frisbees in the parking lot and everything. And there will be a lot of bands that won't even come out of their bus and uh it's just a, it's sad because you could be having these cool moments with us getting to know us you know That's i always so think of like elevators when uh when i think of life where i used to get in the elevator and put my hat down because i was like in your town and i didn't want you know to whatever and now i'm the opposite of that because I'm probably the least interesting guy on the elevator. Everybody has such an amazing story. Uh, I would rather find that out instead of thinking that I'm the special one in the elevator. I'm, I've learned that I'm not. And so uh, come out and play Frisbee. Come and find out what, what, the, what the tech guys are like because they're all pretty interesting people. So for you, when you look back on your career and your success and now the new album coming out, AM gold, which comes out on May 20th and the big tour this summer, what are the things that you feel you've had to overcome the most, the things that people could relate to? If they heard your story, they would say, well, if, you know, if he's had to overcome that, you know, I'm, I'm sure I can overcome whatever's in whatever obstacle is in my life as well. Hmm. That's a interesting question. I'm not it sounds sure. like, it sounds like you've evolved quite a bit as a person. Um, yeah, I think I think through the years and almost like you you feel like you've become we mentioned you feel like you've become a better person, but that some things might have been in your way along the way. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was probably me. Uh, I think there's a lot of times that I can see in other people that they need to get out of their own way. I think I may have had that problem. Um, 
but I think that it also comes with trust where if you want to overcome you getting in your own way, you have to trust people. Uh, you have to give it a chance. You know, you have to find people around you that you can trust. Like I trust my wife. I trust my manager. Uh, and the reason I do is because I, I've given them so many chances to not be trusted and not once have they ever not had my best interest in mind. And so I I've learned to like, stop fighting, like don't fight people anymore. Let them be okay with, uh, with, with not being, you know, be okay with being betrayed basically, or, or be okay with not, not getting what you expected. Well, I tell people the same thing uh, privately that I tell them um, on the radio is that I have seen train for years and years and years now. You have been a staple of my summer concert season for years and years and years. And never once have you disappointed me or anybody else when you're no, on thanks. stage at any show that I've ever been to. So we look forward to seeing you this summer. The album is out. It just feels so good. It's called AM Gold. The album comes out on May 20th. And again, tickets are on sale now for the tour through Ticketmaster.com for Train and Jewel and Blues Traveler. I can't thank you enough, not only for taking the time, but being so open and sharing so much of yourself with everybody today on the podcast. Well, I hope this, uh, I hope this is the bit, biggest bod podcast of all time because uh, you're really great at it. Thank you very much. That's quite a compliment. I appreciate it very much. You take care. We'll see you soon, Pat. Take care. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.